Hello, welcome to Heritage Church. We are so glad that you are joining us for worship today. As a church, we exist to connect people to God, to each other, and to their purpose. So if this is your first time joining us for service, or if you have any questions, prayer requests, or want to talk to one of our pastors, please go to heritageqc.com connect, and one of us on the pastoral team will contact you this week. For now, I'd like to invite you to raise your voice to make a joyful noise as we begin to worship God together. Would you sing with me? Good morning, Heritage Church. I hope you guys are all doing well. Stand and put our hands together as we worship the Lord this morning.
God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven, is seated at the right hand of the Father, and will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Church Universal, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.
continue to raise our voices together. In Christ alone, my hope is found. He's my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace, when fears are stilled, when striving ceases. My comforter, my all in all, here in the love of Christ, I stand. pray with me. Father, Son, and Spirit, we are again so thankful to be able to stand here in this place to lift your name on high. 
Father, the great words that we have been able to say and sing here this morning of what we believe, the truths that are solid, that foundation that we build our lives upon, that you are Father, Son, Holy Spirit, died, rose again, so that now we can stand in victory. And so, Father, we we can always continue to look forward to the great things, the promises of heaven and all that that entails. But Father, you've also called us to these moments, to the here and the now, to stand with Holy Spirit power within us, to live as Christ, to live lives of love and sacrifice to those around us. So thank you for that reminder here. And as we continue to jump into your word, we pray that you continue to remind us, continue to shape us, form us into what you desire for us to be. Not so that we can just be something different, but so that we can be what you desire and we can live lives to the full. We pray all this in your name. And everyone said, amen. Amen. Well, happy Sunday, Heritage family. All right. Yes, we're good. Okay. Some of us are good. I don't know about the rest of you, but you're going to be great on the other side of this. I promise. I can't wait for us to unpack some of these truths of God's word together as we walk through over the next several weeks, the book of Ephesians. Now we're going to unpack where that is and some, some of the why behind the book. And actually, I'm just going to give you a roadmap right now for how we're going to handle today because today we're, we're kind of setting up this series and reading through the first chapter of the book of Ephesians. So today what we're going to do is we're going to, we're going to interact around really what's the white hot why behind this conversation. And then we're going to interact around what is the key thing I believe God wants us to walk away with through this series. Then we're going to talk through who is connected and involved in that and how we do it together. So we're going to walk through those things through the book called Ephesians. Now, as I said, I'm going to tell you where to find that here in a minute. Here's a hint. It's in the Bible, okay? And I'll even give you some advanced warning. It's in like the second part of the Bible, okay? But we'll go, <laughs> we'll get it more uh, dialed in here in just a moment. But as we're getting ready to do that, uh, I want to just again remind you of how much I love you and I'm grateful for you and how I love the story that God is writing through Heritage and that he's been writing in my life. In fact, uh, some of you know I grew up in a little tiny ranch in the desert southwest in southeastern Arizona. And uh, one of of my early, early memories is actually of uh, just a moment of encounter with God where I felt like I knew I needed him and he needed to do something in me to, to, to bring me to life. And so even as a little, little boy at about three years old, I had this incredible, wonderful encounter with God. And about right then, something sparked inside of me where I knew that I knew that I knew that part of why God has me on this earth is to teach about him and his word. That's just part of why I'm here. And so about immediately after that experience with Jesus, I began to preach. And I began to preach to anything who would listen. So growing up on a little ranch in the desert southwest, the only things I could get to listen were the chickens in our backyard. So literally, I would go stand, backyard being, you know, a generous term, I would go stand 
on our back porch, the chicken coop f far enough down that we didn't get overwhelmed by the stink of it, but then the chickens would kind of free roam. And so I would go stand on our back porch and belt I don't know what to the chickens, but I would preach at the chickens. And something I want you to know, this is not to shame you at all, but the chickens were much more expressive than some of you are here today. In fact, I mean, like, they would nod their heads, they would move around. I discovered if you throw a little food in front of a chicken, it will stick around for as long as that food is there. Now, you vegans in the room, I apologize in advance, but part of this, I came to believe, was actually like pre-blessing our food, right? Because each of these chickens were going to be dinner at some point. So we just pre-blessed the food. It was great. At one point, I asked my grandpa, who did some stuff with work, I was like, can you build little chicken altars, and maybe they can do business with God before the great end comes, you know? That didn't happen. But Eventually, I graduated up to inviting people into my room for like rallies and crusades. And the only people I could convince to do that were the people who I was older than in our immediate family, my younger brother and sister. So they would be conscripted into these crusades. And I remember one night I had my brother Anthony, who's two years younger than me. I was probably about five at the time, maybe six. So, you know, he's, he's four-ish probably. And my sister's a year younger than him, and I got them into the room, and I felt like, hey, if God can use me to preach at three, he can use my sister to lead worship at three. So I had her lead worship, and it was fine for a minute. I mean, the stuffed animals didn't seem to mind it too much, but, but can I just tell you, I mean, she was doing it wrong, okay? <laughs> I mean, it was bad. It was, it was wrong. And here's how I knew it was wrong. Because see, I had been brought up to know that when you are truly worshiping in the presence of God, your hands are raised up like this. And if it's like an overwhelming presence, then maybe they wave a little bit like this. And she was not doing either of those things. So she was doing it wrong. I informed her she was doing it wrong. Even then, she was a strong personality, and uh, she tried to physically convince me she was doing it right. And, uh, and so, you know, my mom kind of starts to hear this ruckus. My brother, on the other hand, he's smart enough to know because at this point, things are getting heated. Here we are to worship Jesus, and I'm going to preach, okay? And you're doing it wrong, sister. So if you can't get it right, maybe you just ought to leave. Now, my brother is smart enough to notice that you get to leave the room if you don't lift your hand up in the air. That's what happens. So he starts worship, worshiping like this. I mean, he was doing it wrong too. And, uh, and so sure enough, you know, my mom came in, she finds out what's going on, and we have a conversation around, around you know, all kinds of things. Uh, I won't bore you with there. Pause there. Now I wanna fast forward, because you know, that's something that little kids do, right? It's probably a little too revealing about me. I'll risk it. But fast forward several years, and I'm, I get to be the senior pastor of a tiny little church in a town in northern Maine. Now, this is just between you and me, okay? It's just us. And those of you joining us on TV, hi, men in Kiwani, online, it's just us. <laughs> if the doctor ever tells you that you only have six months left to live, I recommend you move to that place that I was pastoring in my first church because it will feel like a lifetime, all right? It's just, again, a little, little revealing there, maybe. So here we are. I, I'm at this church. God is doing actually some really great things that only he gets credit for. And um, I, we had a new staff member who had joined the team, and I wanted to inv inv uh, introduce this new staff member to the community's oldest living resident and longest member of our little church. So I took him into town to meet with this, uh, this beautiful woman. And when we arrive at the nursing home, she is seated at the head of the table, at the head of a great big banquet table, as you would expect somebody of such, you know, renown to be. She is the longest living person in town. She is, you know, she's her. And there she is. She's holding court. At the, at the head of this table. They're about to serve food, and so over the, uh, over the din and, and noise of, of that, I say, you know, hey there, I want to introduce you. She goes, oh, hi, pastor, how are you? Now, what had been happening while this is going on is we had finally decided that we needed to change the carpet and the chairs in the church building that had not been touched in, like, ever 
okay? The carpet was, was really, literally last replaced in the 30s, and that's about when the pews had been replaced. So the pews were built for people who lived in the 30s, who were slight of build, okay, and did not have long legs. So if you were to go sit on one of those initial pews, you would find that part of you hung off the edge of that, all right, and you couldn't quite fit. So anyway, long story, we decided to, to transition that. People were really excited about it. It was great. And there's, there's this, this woman. She's sitting at the head of her table. She meets the new assistant pastor. It's great. And, you know, she's speaking in such a way that she starts getting quieter and quieter so that I have to lean in to hear what she's saying. Now, I got, you guys, there's like, it felt like dozens and dozens and dozens of people in the room. And she goes, Pastor, let me ask you a question. I said, okay. What do you need? Did you get those pretty new chairs yet? And I said, yeah, we did. In fact, part of why I came here was to invite you to an event we're having that you're going to love and you're going to get to see them. And she said, with all the volume she could muster, she pushed herself back from the head of the table and said, you're doing it wrong. Pastor? Somebody should cut your grass. Now, what I want you to know, she did not say cut. She said kick. And she did not say grass. Okay. This is a true story. It really happened. And so here are two different stories, one with some young kids, one with some older kids. And here's the conversation. Both of those are people who are passionate about the stuff of Jesus and his church. And both of them are examples of where any of us can fit at any time where we're convinced there's a group of people who are doing it right. And there's a group of people who are doing it not like us. <laughs> Wrong. <laughs> There's our way, the right way, and then there's the wrong way. And as we interact with the stuff of Jesus and his church, we have all kinds of opportunity to interact with people who are very different than us, people who have different perspectives and stories and histories and opportunities, people who have encountered God in different ways, people who might have different backstories, and they might wonder why we live one way and are inviting them to do another. And we might live in these moments where we say, man, they are doing it wrong. Thank God he has revealed himself to us, the ones who do it right. I share that with us because we're not the first ones to live in this kind of back and forth of what's right and wrong. I share it because the question I guess I have for us is who gets to decide what's right, what's best, what's not best, what's wrong. In the book of Ephesians, which we find in the New Testament, which is really just a, a, a term that means the story of Jesus and his church. And there's actually, there should be a, a slide coming up here that shows you where you can find it, because we're going to be in the first chapter of Ephesians. So if you want to turn there or swipe there, you can do that. But this book actually happens to be written to a group of people who have varying groups within this collective gathering called the church. And there's a group over here who insists that in order to do it right, you actually have to fulfill all of the old law along with the new invitation of Jesus. That's what doing it right means. And then there's a group over here who insists that in order to do it right, you kind of have to forget some of that stuff and start living only into this piece over here. And so we're doing it right and they're doing it wrong, but who gets to decide? What does it look like for them to find purpose and unity together? Now, Ephesians is a letter. It's written by a man named Paul to this group of churches in a geographic area called Ephesus. What that means for us, and this is just kind of, it's free on the aside, but I'll share it anyway. As we're reading through the book of Ephesians over the next several weeks, you're going to come across a word that looks pretty familiar. It's the word you, Y-O-U. Familiar with it? Seen it before? Yes. The six of you who are awake, that's great. I'm so glad you're tracking. <laughs> so when you see that word you in the book of Ephesians, remember that this is a letter written to a group of people called the church and to a group of churches, local churches, gathering. So the term you is never meant specifically for one single person. It's meant for all y'all, right? It's everyone together. So surely there's some, some point of application for us individually. But the point that I believe would be helpful for us to understand at this point is that when it comes 
to connecting with God and others and our purpose, part of what that reveals to me is that is only encountered and experienced in the beauty of community. That it's all y'all together who experience the power of God. It's all of you together who discover what it looks like to live for him. Now, this book was actually written with a pretty specific purpose in mind. It's a it's very clear that the writer is wanting us to understand how we, the gathered people of Jesus called the church, are to connect with God, others, and our purpose uniquely. And there's a, a kind of a white hot why behind it that we see peppered throughout, not, not even in just one specific moment, but throughout the conversation, we see this incredible reason why this book at this time was written to these people and for us today. It's that Jesus is God and King. That's the why behind it. And I know that's like, wow, that's super mind-blowing, Jeremiah. I'm super thrilled that we are here because that's just like peeling back the layers for me. But it's actually this, the white hot why, the significant conversation behind the, the book of Ephesians that we have. The writer is absolutely convinced of this, and it's the backdrop against which he's writing invitations to the church to be who God wants us to be, to experience God's goodness and freedom. Jesus is God and King, and the writer is declaring it in such a way throughout that we see Jesus is God and King no matter what our circumstances are. That it is true, Jesus is the true God and the true King, even when it feels as though everything's falling apart around us. That he's a true God and true king, even when there are wars and rumors of wars, when there's incursions in Europe and Asia, Jesus is still God and king. Even when there are new variants of this thing that never seems to die, Jesus is God and king. Even when our family is on the verge of breaking apart, Jesus is God and king. Even when I get the diagnosis I feared the most, Jesus is God and and king. This is the white hot why behind this. So how do we interact with that? What is the key truth that we're supposed to get to? In order to understand that first, I think some background is helpful. You see, this book is written to a group of Christ followers who the white hot why is Jesus is God and king, but they live in this town called Ephesus that's known for two things. One is it's seen as a far extension of the king's power. It's where one of his seats of authority is. The king in this day and age is a person called Caesar. And so Ephesus is one of the, is one of the governmental seats of Caesar. And what that means is that all throughout town, if you were to walk around first century Ephesus, you would find statues and shrines and signs that declare Caesar is Lord. In those words. You might even come across coins or other signs or shrines that give other titles for him, his full royal title. The person who's, who's kind of leading and called the leader of the whole world at this point is a man, he calls himself Caesar, King of Kings, Lord of Lords, and Prince of Peace. That's his divine title. And so you get the sense that when Paul says, Jesus is king. It's not just standing in contrast, but in direct conflict with this king. Because Jesus is a king, not like Caesar, who holds on to his power by sheer force of will and conquering others, who crucifies them and destroys them until they submit to him. No, Jesus is king who, instead of taking life, gives his life for the sake of others. So it's not just in contrast, but direct conflict with the dark powers of that age. The other thing really well known in Ephesus at the time is, is there's this great big huge temple that people from miles and miles and miles around the whole world knows about it, and they will come to worship this goddess named Artemis or Diana. And we don't have time to get into all the kind of ways and places of worship for her, but, but what is helpful to know is that these people who would come and worship her would refer to her, I want to make sure I, uh, I get this right, that they would call her Queen of Heaven, God our Mother, Savior of the World. 
And so here we find the church in Ephesus being reminded Jesus is God and King. And though things are dark, and though there are others who would, who would seek to try to say they get to be the most powerful person in the room, that they get to be the one who decides what's right and what's wrong, Jesus is God and King. And he's a God unlike any other because Jesus gave himself for us. He rose from the dead for us. He ascended to heaven for us. He intercedes for us. Jesus is God and King. Only one of these three, Caesar, Artemis, Jesus, gets to have our allegiance, which will it be? This is the context of what's happening here. So the why of Jesus is God and King makes a lot more sense when you understand some of that. Now, those of you who hate history, you can breathe easy because we're done. So with that why being there, what is the point? What is the thing that the writer keeps coming back to to help us understand what it looks like to really connect with God, others, and our purpose as people convinced Jesus is God and King? We actually see that laid out here in verses 9 and 10. This is, this is the what that will hold everything together. God has now revealed to us his mysterious plan regarding Christ a plan to fulfill his own good pleasure. This is it. At the right time, he will bring everything together under the authority of Christ, everything on heaven, in heaven and on earth. So this is the what. That Jesus, who's God and King, is actually going to bring everything in unity under his leadership and authority. And for you and for me, what that means is this. In a world that seems marked by what divides us, by what ism we're a part of, by what thing we do right that everybody else does wrong, by the thing that would say, I've figured it out and they haven't, and if they just did it my way, everything would be fine. All of those places, they actually come into the unity of purpose that Jesus has, that somehow this Jesus, who is God and King, is powerful enough that every authority under heaven, that every activity under earth, earth, that every relationship that we have, that everything we might be tempted to give our allegiance to first comes under the powerful leadership of Jesus for his purpose. Good preaching. Now here's, here's why that's so important for us. The scripture that we just read said this is the plan, that God is going to do this. And I believe God has been doing that. In fact, the writer will go on to say and explain to us that God is bringing all of these separate things together. These things that actually seem like they're in conflict with one another is bringing them into purpose and unity right here, right now, through his people, the church. That we're the ones who get to live as an advanced signpost of what it looks like to live under the unity and purpose of Jesus. Now, before we go any further, one of the things I want to point out in the scripture we just read is that this plan, this plan before the world even existed to provide the gift of Jesus who would offer himself for us so we could live in purpose and unity and that we could know and experience the goodness of God and his kingdom, that the scriptures say it was his good pleasure to do that. He wanted to do so. It says he has showered his kindness on us. Friends, there are some of you in the room right now who your understanding of who God is and what it means to belong to his church is not one marked by love and joy and kindness, but one where you've been taught that part of living in unity means that the list of don'ts far outweighs the list of do's, and that if you mess up and you step over into the list of don'ts too much, then God might just be done with you because you need to live in fear of him. Can I tell you? That's taken a page out of the book of Artemis. The good book of Jesus 
the writing in Ephesians would tell us it is God's good pleasure. It brings him joy. His desire is for you not to live in constant fear of him, but in joyful relationship with him to know he is for you. He is so beyond for you. It was before the world was even created, he chose you. He is so for you that he is bringing all the things that seem broken and desperate and disconnected and too far gone into unity under his leadership for his glory and the good of the church. This is what we're invited to see and experience. This group of us called his church, we are the ones who are to live so convinced that Jesus is God and King unlike any other, to live so passionately as an example of what it looks like for everything to be brought into unity and power under the authority of Jesus, that when people bump into us, they experience the power of heaven. Remember that when you go to lunch later and the service is slow, for real. You and I are to be the advanced indicators that the kingdom of Jesus is here. And it's here among us that we get to be part of his incredible story that he is telling. That it's the church together who lives in unity and purpose that is an example of the unity and purpose Jesus is bringing. This is why I was and am so heartbroken of how the church in North America handled the opportunity of COVID. Because the people of Jesus who were supposed to say that Jesus can take even the most disparate and disconnected and even counterintuitive things, things that seem like they ought to be fighting each other, even all of that, Jesus can bring them together in unity of purpose and joy and hope. And this was the moment where the church, church, empowered by God's spirit, pursuing his purpose, was to stand and say, look, bring unity and purpose and light and life. Follow us in the way of Jesus who brings everything into unity under his good purposes. And instead, we were found on soapboxes, submitting ourselves to false gods and kings. Oh, church. But here we are. And that we are here as those who are called by Jesus and empowered by his spirit, we have opportunity from this day forward to be those who live in purpose and unity. This day, where the writers would say, hey, uh, there is neither Jew nor Greek, male and female, slave and free in Jesus. We all come one together. When people would ask in Ephesians or in Ephesus, so who gets to lead? Men or women? Like, who gets to lead? And Jesus would say, yep, yes. Who, who gets to play a real role in what God wants to do in the world? Is it people who have a clean backstory, who, who haven't ever done very much wrong, but have received Jesus? Or is it the people with like the most, the most sordid past? Who gets to be a full value member? And Jesus would say, yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Who gets to belong? Who gets to be a participant? Who gets to see the goodness of God brought to bear? It's everyone who calls on the name of Jesus. And that's who we are. If all of this seems impossible, it's because it is. And yet, it's what we're called to do. So if it's impossible, how do we do it? How do we live into this? Again, the, the story in Ephesians is going to be this conversation looking at how we live in purpose and unity under the leadership of Jesus in our homes, in our workplaces, in the marketplace, in the community around us, in our most broken relationships. How do we do it? The answer, the answer, the answer is and always has been and only will be Holy Spirit power. We cannot do this on our own. In our own strength, in our own perspective, we will always end up in one camp or the other saying, you're doing it wrong. But under the leadership of Holy Spirit and his power, now we get to live with new purpose and hope. We see this 
laid out for us. It's actually a prayer prayed over the Ephesian church. And I believe it echoes through the ages over us here as well. Here's what the writer says. I pray that you will understand the incredible greatness of God's power for us who believe in him. I pray you will understand the incredible greatness of God's power for us who believe him. The incredible greatness of God's power for us who believe him. This is the same mighty power that raised Christ from the dead and seated him in the place of honor at God's right hand in the heavenly realms. Now he is far above any ruler or authority or power or leader or anything else, not only in this world but also in the world to come. God has put all things under the authority of Christ and has made him head over all things for the benefit of the church, and the church is his body. It is made full and complete by Christ who fills all things everywhere with himself. You see, the same power that rose Christ Jesus from the dead is the power that abides within us by Holy Spirit as a seal, an advanced signpost that Jesus is who he says he is, that he is God and King. And I believe more than ever before that God wants to use you, church, together to be vessels of this same power that rose Christ Jesus from the dead in spaces and places right around us that seem too far gone, that seem that hope is dead, that future cannot happen, as though everything is falling apart at the seams, and that's just the way that it has to be. And we say in the name of Jesus as King and God, no. He is alive, he is king, he is good, and the same power that rose Christ Jesus from the dead can bring healing and life and light. It can restore broken relationships, it can bring us into purpose, it can help us to know and experience purpose as we have never known before the kind of pursuit of Jesus that will pour our lives out for. It can move us into spaces and places where nobody else wants to go because it's too dark or dangerous or scary or upsetting, or there are too many isms of division. And that is where we go as we have the Holy Spirit of risen Jesus in us, activating us, not one in one, but as the church together. This is good. It's good news because it's good news for us. It's what God is about doing. And so here's the problem. We often live as though God wants to reveal his power around us but not in us and through us. You see, when I was speaking just then, some of you were like, yes, God wants to go do that. He wants to go into those places. He wants to help those people over there. He might even want to distantly adjust some things in my life by zapping it from heaven into what it ought to be, and that would be fine. But what we forget is that Holy Spirit lives in us. And he desires to do his good work in and through us together. Us together. This is why your passionate pursuit of Jesus and mine, they matter not just for me, but because us together choosing the way of righteous living us together choosing the path of Jesus. Man, it can change everything as Jesus brings all things in unity under his good, pleasing, and perfect purpose. So here's the question. Friends, where does God want to reveal himself in power through you? Through you individually, but also through us together. Where does God want to reveal himself in power? If you've never received the gift of Jesus as the one who who forgives you and leads you as the one true God and King in your life, today's the day. There's, There's no time like the present. I invite you to ask him to be the one who forgives and leads you as far as you understand that to me. See what he does. Let us know that you've done that, speaking to a pastor or using a connect card. If you're watching on TV, you can use the text number that is up on the screen right now to let us know that you're doing that. 
But I believe you have a spot, you have a place in your world, and we have a place in ours together where God wants to reveal himself in power so great that undeniably people would see and say, Jesus is king, and he is God unlike any other. To that end, friends, I'm just going to pray that passage of scripture, that prayer that was prayed over the Ephesians. I'm going to pray it over us and ask God to do what only he can do. So let's pray it together. I pray in the name of Jesus that Heritage Church would understand the incredible greatness of God's power for us who believe in him. That we would know and live out that this is the same mighty power that raised Christ from the dead that we would live as though Jesus is seated in the place of honor at God's right hand in the heavenly realms, that we would be people who consistently and passionately proclaim that he is far above any ruler or authority or power or leader or anything else, not only in this world but also in the world to come that we would live as signposts of those declaring God has put all things under the authority of Christ and that he has made Jesus head over all things for the benefit of the church and the glory of God. I pray that this church, his body, would be made full and complete by Christ who fills all things everywhere with himself. Amen. Who am I that the highest king would welcome me? I was lost, but he brought me and know oh, his love for me. Oh, his love for me. Libre soy en el libre. He has ransomed me, His grace runs deep. While I was a slave to sin, Jesus died for me. Yes, He died.
something during the service struck a chord with you and you'd like to have someone pray with you, or if you have a follow-up question is something said during the sermon, I'd encourage you to go to heritageqc.com connect and one of us on the pastoral team will reach out to you this week. That's also a great way to find out which groups, classes, and events we are offering. Did you know that the only place in the Bible God says we can and should test Him is in our tithing? We'd encourage you to faithfully risk with us and give with radical generosity. It is your giving to the ministries of Heritage Church that makes programs like this possible. One of the easiest ways to do this is by going to heritageqc.com slash give. Thank you so much for joining us for worship today, and we will see you next week. <laughs>